Good afternoon, distinguished guests, colleagues. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this incredibly important event to honor Professor Hari Srihari. Uh, my name is Kemper Lewis. I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and welcoming you and kicking off this event. Uh, we are here to celebrate the incredible past contributions of Professor uh, Hari Srihari also to celebrate and recognize his legacy, but also we will be discussing how his impact continues and will continue to impact science and people and society. Uh, so to help kick off this event, uh, it's my privilege and honor to introduce our president, President Satish K. Tripathi, who is also a colleague of Professor Srihari for many years. President Tripathi. Thank you, Kemper, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's symposium in honor of a model professor, a dear colleague, and a dedicated mentor to generations of students, some of whom we will hear from later in this event. I'm sorry I could not be with you in person to pay tribute to our friend, Dr. Sarbur Harishri Hari. But I would like to extend my deepest condolences to Professor Rohani Srihari, Hari's sons, Dilip and Ashok, his entire family, his colleagues at UB and beyond, and all those whose lives he touched. We know that to be a long list indeed. We also know that Hari was a towering figure in his field, a groundbreaking innovator, who put UB's Department of Computer Science and Engineering on the map. He transformed pattern recognition, machine learning, and computational forensics with findings that brought global renown to UB and had a profound impact on society. And despite his remarkable achievements, Hari was humble to the core. Last week when I spoke to our graduates at UB, UB's first commencement ceremony of the season, I impressed on them the importance of keeping humility as their constant companion during their life's journey. A mental writer, Mandeline Lengol, described humility as throwing oneself away in complete concentration on something or someone else. I think this description perfectly characterizes Hari's approach to life. As a mentor, Hari was patient, kind, and, and attentive, with the expansive smile that revealed his generous nature. In the classroom and in the lab, he created transformative opportunities that enabled his students to excel in their own right. And long after these students had established themselves in their careers, he would reach out to them to offer help and guidance. Through his devotion to his students and his monumental service to his being, Hari embodied UB's mission of excellence. He was not only one of UB's most distinguished professors, but also, I would argue, a lifelong student. And not only of computer science, Hari had a love of learning that inspired so many who crossed his path. In addition to expertise in his field, he was curious and knowledgeable about a wide variety of subjects, from history to botany to cricket. If you friended him on Facebook, you would be treated to his enlightening post on these matters, not to mention photos of his beloved granddaughter in her buffalo bills, footies, and pajamas. <laughs> Hari was many things to many people, a brilliant but unassuming scientist, a loving and supporting husband, father, and grandfather, a consummate university citizen, epitome of a renaissance man. A moment ago, I mentioned that I had addressed the 
members of the UV class of 2022 at our first commencement exercise earlier, uh, actually last week. On May 20th, during the graduate ceremonies of uh, College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, it will be my distinct privilege to recognize Dr. Shihari with a UV President's Medal. husband behalf is presented to an individual who has expended extraordinary effort on behalf of the university and the community in this side. Like today's symposium, I look forward to that occasion to celebrate the impactful life and legacy of the truly gifted and deeply giving Hari Shehari. I hope it brings comfort to all of us to know that Hari's legacy burns not bright in his children, his granddaughter, and the students he mentored, and in turn, the students they have gone on to mentor. Thank you. President Tuprati, thank you for your profound remarks. I know we were all touched by them. Um, and they were inspired by Professor Shihari's impact on life as well. So now I want to introduce one of the co-hosts and co-organizers of this symposium, Dr. Tim Kam Ho, uh, who's here and was one of Professor Har Shihari Shihari's former PhD students in 1992, so it's 30 year anniversary of when you graduated. And we're all here, really, this, this, this symposium really came together because of a lot of her hard work, and so, She's one of our co-MCs today, so um, come on up, Tim. Nice to see you. It is my great honor to uh, take up this responsibility of uh, trying to organize uh, this uh, memorial event for Professor Jeremy, who is uh, my esteemed professor and my advisor of uh, almost five years. Um, so as uh, uh, Dean said, uh, it was exactly 30 years uh, ago that I received, received the PhD uh, under Shihari's uh, guidance. Um, now, 30 years later, I came back here, so I just try to uh, remember a few things about Professor Shihari's accomplishments um, in the several presentations that we have prepared for you. So first of all, I just want to introduce uh, Professor Jai Ran, uh, who, is, uh, who joined the CS department in 1989, so that's uh, a couple of years uh, before I, I left. And he's, he has known Professor Shihari for over 30 years uh, as a colleague and also a well-wisher. So um, he served as the CSC department chair from 2001 to 2009 and has uh, retired from UV last year. So we would like to invite uh, Professor Jolly Raman to uh, come up here to say a few things about Professor Shihari. I have some prepared remarks. Uh, this is a, a short summary of Professor Srihari's career of research and teaching at the University at Buffalo. You know, as I started to prepare this summary, I, I was just thinking, you know, about all the things that I would like to say about our dear colleague and friend, Hari. Um, I wanted to be more specific and detailed about his achievements which will be elaborated later on by his former students. And so I, I stumbled upon Hari's uh, CV online. And just as, uh, you know, one would expect, you know, Hari had just written out so beautifully, so concisely, and so thoroughly, you know, his achievements. Uh, and so Hari, you know, I take your permission that I be liberally Quote what you have written in your 
very nice summary. I will start with an account of Professor Sriharya's research. Uh, this description um, is about his career in artificial intelligence. It spanned five decades, uh, beginning with statistical pattern recognition and culminating eventually in, uh, in deep learning. Uh, he contributed to the methodology of these fields while drawing motivation from two applications of broad societal interest. The first being document image analysis and the second being uh, forensics. So first I'll talk about his uh, contributions in, in image analysis, document image analysis. You know, so uh, Hari's early papers in, were in the representation of three-dimensional images such as those produced uh, by com com computational tomography. His ACM computing surveys article on this topic was very influential and ha has citations even till this day in the area of 3D printing. Uh, his work with his first PhD student on hyperquadries for multidimensional images was published in the communications of the ACM, a, a flagship you know, journal of the, uh, of the society, and was featured on its cover. Hari went on to author or co-author some 400 scientific articles in journals and conferences and chapters of, of books. You know, his, his first external research funding was from the National Science Foundation. It was for the study of the role of context in recognizing text. You know, at the end of this project, he approached the United States Postal Service, USPS, for funding because there was a potential use of his research in address reading machines. Well, perhaps little did Hari know what was going to happen. The USPS provided him a small grant, $100,000, to study existing printed address reading technology. One thing led to another, and I would say within a 10 year period, uh, Hari received large scale funding from the US Postal Service for several projects. Uh, project for determining address blocks on letters and irregular sized parcels, for reading poorly printed addresses, and for reading handwritten addresses. Hari would, would tell me, you know, said, you know, but if you were to write a Christmas card, okay, and you were to write the address on the Christmas card and mail it, you know, my technology can read the address that you have written and it would spray the nine-digit barcode automatically. I don't know how you know, telling me about that. So this work you know, culminated you know, in the formation at UB of the USPS Center of Excellence for Document Analysis and Recognition, known as CEDA. I recall Hari mentioning that the then Postmaster General of the United States, Anthony Frank, was personally involved in the formation of the center. I remember he said, you know, we did not add the word excellence to ourselves. Okay, that was a word that the Postmaster General, you know, chose for our center. Uh, the center's work eventually involved more than a dozen projects and literally over 100 graduate students and a dozen full-time staff. At one point, I, I understand there were 150 people on the payroll at CEDAR. Uh, and uh, it raised over $60 million you know, over, the, over the period. The, the work of CEDA received worldwide attention and has had significant impact on the field. Handwritten digit recognition has today become the iconic example for machine learning. You could just go to Yahoo and say, give me an example of machine learning, and you're going to get recognizing handwritten digits. But the USPS data set that was collected in Buffalo was later succeeded by the more widely used uh, MNIST uh, data set. Document analysis and recognition was recognized as an important application area of pattern recognition and machine learning. And it spawned several conferences and also a journal. Uh, the first large scale handwritten address interpretation system in the world was deployed by the USPS, eventually <coughs> allowing the reading of over 90% of the handwritten U.S. mail. I, I understood that in the very first year of deployment that they read 20% of all handwritten addresses.
services with 100% accuracy. Okay, and that itself saved the postal service some $200 million in the first year itself. Well, for the remaining 80% was, well, more research to be done, uh, and uh, that in turn led to greater advances in, hand, in the recognition of handwritten addresses. Uh, the, 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 the work was exhibited uh, in uh, the National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, the work received worldwide attention and was featured on CNN, ABC News, Discovery Channel, Beyond 2000 Australia, and so forth. The Internal Revenue Service used the name and address block reader developed at Zeno to read the 1040 EZ tax form. The UK Royal Mail and the Australian Post used the handwritten address readers for their mail. You know, so the work on, on document and image analysis you know, was very, very impactful. Um, you know, after that, Hari devoted and turned his, his attention to the area of forensic science. You know, whereas handwritten, handwriting recognition was to be able to see what is common between diverse writing styles. The work in forensics was to identify the individuality of, of handwriting. So it was just the, the other problem. And uh, the National Institute of Justice contacted Hari about the need for a scientific basis for continuing to allow impression evidence such as handwriting to be presented as evidence in the courts. Hari's first effort with funding from the NIJ was on quantifying the individuality of handwriting. A resulting paper in the Journal of Forensic Sciences was hailed by the community as providing a basis for admitting handwriting evidence in several cases. Hari himself testified in several hearings, including at the federal level, as to whether handwriting could be admitted as evidence. The handwriting work led to the first automated system known as Cedar Fox for determining whether two handwritten samples came from the same writer or whether they came from different writers. It was issued as a US patent and Hari formed a company called Cedar Tech commercialized this technology. The work was featured uh, in a NOVA episode on PBS regarding the Lindbergh kidnapping. Uh, Hari then extended this work uh, on handwriting comparison to the comparison of fingerprints and footwear prints. And so there was you know, gradual development of, the, of this idea. He was subsequently invited to serve on the prestigious National Academy of Sciences Committee on identifying the needs of the forensic science community. Hari was the only computer scientist, um, scientist of this committee, which was headed by a federal appeals court judge. The report has had a major impact on courts worldwide and received a prestigious award by the Innocence Project. I'd like to say a little bit about Hari's teaching. Hari had a passion for teaching, and he mentioned this to me many times. Uh, his interest in teaching pattern recognition and machine learning extended over four decades. He developed an extensive set of lecture slides on topics such as introductory machine learning, deep learning, probabilistic, graphical models. His lecture slides and videos were widely used in courses around the world. The courses are listed in 10 free top-notch machine learning courses of the influential KDD Nuggets site. Hari has conducted a number of tutorials and use of Cedar Fox, you know, the software system for comparing uh, handwriting. The, the software was well known to the forensics community, and Hari conducted many tutorials for them, including for the National Forensic Science Technology Center. Hari's most recent teaching efforts towards in the, the last couple of years were focused on integrating the avalanche of research being produced in deep learning. He was video recording his explanation of topics in deep learning on Zoom and was also live streaming on Facebook. His, his recent lectures on topics such as attention models and recommender systems have received uh, thousands of views. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, through uh, research seminars, Hari was exploring the topic of neurosymbolic artificial intelligence in an attempt to combine the best of both paradigms, both symbolic representation and uh, you know, great teachers are known also by the scholars that they train and mentor who themselves go on to become great uh, researchers. Uh, Hari had several research scholars and he advised over 40 PhD students and hundreds of master's students. Perhaps most financially successful of them 
uh, was Jan Hong Robin Lee, who founded the search engine giant Baidu and became the first Chinese billionaire. Among the other more uh, notable PhD uh, graduates are my co-chair, Tim Kiam Ho, who invented the important classification method called Random Forest. She received Bell Labs President's Gold Award for, and is presently at IBM Research, where she's regarded as a master inventor. She's also an IT and IBM fellow. Jonathan Hull, another PhD graduate, served for several decades as a principal research scientist at Rico Silicon Valley. He holds over a hundred U.S. patents, I am told. Uh, Darsha and Lee uh, made important contributions to deep learning at Google. And last but not least in this short list uh, is Venu uh, uh, Raju, uh, here, who is uh, a SUNY Distinguished Professor and Vice President of Research and Economic Development. He's a fellow of ACMI company at ABM. You know, just on a personal note, uh, I joined the CS department, as, as Tim said, in 1989. I witnessed at close quarters the many research successes of Professor Sri Hari. In all the years, I knew Hari as a colleague, and especially at tenure and promotion decisions. You know, Hari never gave importance to how much funding this person brought in, how many papers this person wrote, or what is the size of the group. He always gave importance to science and scholarship. Hari was also fully engaged in the life of the department. He didn't view himself as you know, about you know, discussing department matters. He shared his thoughts and provided his, his, his insights, including facts and figures and points of view by email. You know, he, he will be really missed by the department until his passing, I'm sure, the three that have lost a great scientist. Ari and Rohini were gracious hosts, and I very fondly recall the many enjoyable evenings that Padma and I spent at their home. During these days, during the days when I was more active in music, I think I managed to persuade Hari to sing a song. And I think you need I will always remember Hari for his sharp intellect, for his wit and his wisdom, and his laughter and his good cheer and his warmth and his collegiality. In the rest of the symposium, we're going to hear from some of Hari's PhD graduates, from some professors who knew him well. We'll also see uh, a short video and also a panel discussion. So I will request my coach at Incam Ho to continue the, the symposium uh, and introduce our guest speaker for today. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker uh, is uh, a distinguished invite speaker, uh, Professor An Liu Jing. Um, I'm so glad that my brother Jing can come here. Um, Professor Jing is a well-recognized leader in the statistical pattern recognition community uh, since a long time ago, and he stayed uh, as a very uh, respected mentor uh, for the IAPR and for the rest of the community. Um, now, Terry Arise is now a university distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science at Michigan State University. Um, and he served as editor in chief of uh, IEEE Transaction on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence um, uh, for, for some, uh, some period of time. And that's, uh, of course, uh, we know that this is one of the most respected journals in the community. Um, he is also a member of the Defense Science Board and the Forensic Science Standards Board. Now, Professor Jane is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and also the World Academy of Science. And he's also a foreign member of the Indian National Academy of Engineering and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So, most recently, uh, Professor Jane received the uh, Doctor Honoris Causa. 
from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and the Autonomous uh, University of Madrid. So it's a very, very uh, well respected speaker. I'm here as a distinguished speaker. I'm a, I'm a friend of Shri Hari. I know the family for quite some time. In fact, I may be the only one who knows knew Hari the longest in this room. I first met him in, in fall of 1970. Uh, that was my... Uh, I came to Ohio State in, in fall of 1969. when I met uh, Sri Hari in the fall, in fact, uh, that was an interesting year because 1970, some of you may remember, was the year of the uh, uh, protest on the U.S. campuses against the uh, war in Southeast Asia. And uh, so Ohio State was closed for a few days. The National Guard was on the campus. There were tear gas and can shooting took place around the same time. And um, so we, some of us, decided a few friends go, oh, let's go see Niagara Falls because uh, Ohio State campus is closed. So we came here and, of course, we said, well, let's see there's a campus here. So we came to UB campus and turned out that was also, that also had tear gas. So, <laughs> so it was quite an interesting trip. Um, so I, I, first I thought this was just going to be a five just reminiscence about uh, Sri Hari, but then they said, no, I should talk about some pattern recognition stuff. So I started reading Sri Hari's papers and I learned a lot from, from them. Of course, some of them I was familiar with, but uh, still, uh, last three days I was busy uh, reading his papers. Um, so, you know, these days there's a lot of, uh, but I studied, there was pattern recognition and, uh, and AI. Those are the only two. Nobody knew about machine learning, nobody talked about machine learning, nobody talked about these networks. There were networks there, but they were called adaptive networks or perceptron. Um, and, um, and it was always this feeling that AI is somehow superior to pattern recognition, because when you talk about artificial intelligence, you mean a general purpose in practice, <coughs> whereas pattern recognition is solving some specific problem. And, and I'm glad that Shri Hari stuck with the pattern recognition part of it. And I think his biggest contribution was in handwriting recognition, which I don't think AI would say it's, it's a solved problem. It's just like I work in fingerprints and everybody thinks, why should I be working in fingerprints? It's a solved problem. And I think, uh, to his admira admiration, he really uh, made a huge contribution by not getting bothered with this alphabet soup, but uh, staying with solving a specific problem, no matter what tools are available. So I, I looked at all the old photos of, uh, I, was, I didn't spend enough time looking at my 
my old collection to see if I can find any photos from Ohio State. But you know, some of these photos actually illustrate his work um, uh, in both forensics and, uh, and handwriting recognition. Uh, this, uh, I'm sure if I can point it here. So, this photo appeared in the uh, Cleveland uh, Gazette in 1990. Uh, this is some work, well, uh, work he did in uh, fingerprint individuality, shoe print individuality, in addition to the um, handwriting individuality. And this is one of the old machines with this group. Uh, so then I said, you know, Face recognition has made huge advances. Can, can his old photos be matched with, uh, with uh, new photos? So here is the similarity score. So the, <laughs> the, the image on the top left, perhaps that's one of his uh, more recent photos, right? And I said, you know, let's compare that with the state of the art face recognition with all his other photos. So all the scores are very high. These scores are from the and one. So, you know, the threshold is about 0 0.3 or 0 0.35, the photo is not recognized. Uh, and the, the photo in the middle, it could be enrolled because the resolution is not of sufficient quality. So, the point there, you know, the many faces of Shui Hari and its time in way. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Even, we will always have this image in our in our mind, no matter what time did you encounter him. So then, um, since we, his contributions are related to pattern recognition, I said, well, let me look at uh, where the first use of the word pattern recognition appeared. And there's a guy called Selfridge, but I, I don't know if you remember this definition or not, this is 1955. By pattern recognition, we mean the extraction of the significant features from the background of irrelevant detail. That's the segmentation problem. It's the kind of thing that brains seem to do very well that computing machines do not do very well. I mean, you can apply the same thing to whether it's data mining, machine learning, or data science, or AI. The definitions don't matter. It's a task that you have to do. And around the same time, it was a Symposium in 1955. So you see the Selfridge definition and what uh, what uh, uh, McCarthy, Minsky, who are the big names in in artificial intelligence. Some of the younger people here may not even remember their recall their name, but uh, the old timers know that. So making a machine behave in ways that would be called intelligent if a human were so behaving, and then we know about the uh, Turing test, and there was a movie on, on that. So the idea, the point I'm trying to make is that these two fields, pattern recognition and AI, evolved around the same time, and the tools which were available. So, so the work of Perceptron, that was in, again in 1957 by Rosenblatt. Rosenblatt, uh, it's just a one-node network which could only classify linearly separable patterns, and then there was an extension of it to multi-layer perceptrons, and then, like the field of AI, it went through two called filters of AI, where people gave up on AI because they couldn't deliver what it had promised. And so that's why I, what I'm saying is that pattern recognition has always been around, and it will continue to be, because that's what the central task is, recognizing patterns. And there's a lot of hype about the AI, right? And if you find a washing machine, if you go to Best Buy or any other place, they'll say, oh, this is an AI enabled. If you remember in 1980s or 90s, it was fuzzy set enabled uh, washing machine. All right, so all it does is basically estimates the weight and some other things and says, well, we will set the cycle. You know, this is like the expert system that you used to have many years. But I thought this is the another this is an interesting <laughs> I was in Hyderabad in the high tech city and in the bus stand, this is what you see. Data science, AI, deep 
Hitler and just name it, right? The question is who's gonna teach the people who are going to pay tens of thousands of dollars to attend these courses? So, you know, we have to stick to some basics. And when I was studying pattern recognition, everybody, you know, both students and I were with sort of Bayesian decision making the system of pattern recognition. And and AI is a goal. This is just signature analysis. You know, you know, because it's no good. We have to look at the high level thing, knowledge representation, and general purpose problem solving. And now AI is back into statistics. This is the basic decision making. So, <clears throat> so just like perceptron in this in the final development. Actually, this was done uh, a couple of decades before. The Fisher's linear discriminant, which is also just a two-class problem and also based on linearly for, for linearly separable data. And then, remember only iris recognition? Then? <laughs> this is the kind of problems we worked on. You know, 15 patterns per class, can you design a classifier to, to, to separate them, all right? And this data was actually collected by Fisher. So, I think the reason this is important even now is that we were restricted by data in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And even now, we are restricted in the data in forensic science. Data, there's a data privacy issue, it's a double-edged sword. We want to protect the user's privacy, but at the same time, it makes it very difficult for us to, to, to get the data to do an analysis. So when we talk about the National Academy report 2009, that was a major contribution in the sense that it made all the forensic examiners they testify in the court of law, it's not a binary decision. Does this fingerprint match to the fingerprint in the criminal database? That is, partial fingerprint found at a crime scene, does it match with the fingerprint in the database? Yes or no? There is always a probability associated with that. And same thing with the right to right identification. But the data which is available to us analyze this at a large scale is very limited. And so, so Na uh, National Academy's report is not the only one in 2009. It opened people's mind to, to looking at things, but it did not help in, in research. So this is the linearly separable problem, whether you use a statistical approach or a, or a linear perceptron. And then for non-linearly separable data, we have we have quadratic classifier from the statistical framework, a two hidden layer network, a full texture machine. And now everything is under this black box called CNN, convolutional neural network. That is the approach <coughs> people take. They forget about what problem they are solving. Collect the data, feed it to a CNN, and, and look at the prediction. So there's no no notion of domain knowledge. And I think without a domain knowledge, you cannot solve the real world problems like the uh, senior users, uh, uh, postal address meeting machine. So I also wanted to emphasize, and I think Shri Hari uh, paid quite a bit of attention to this, is that no matter whether you call yourself an artificial intelligence researcher, machine learning researcher, data science, the central problem is to find a representation, features, and a similarity match. That's all. And it, has two, it must have two properties, large intra-person similarity and small interperson similarity. That is, if you have multiple faces from in this particular case of the same person, as if this woman was convicted several times over a 10-year period, and the similarity score is very high, so age separation doesn't matter here. 
Whereas in the bottom picture, we have uh, uh, Obama's doppelganger, and we want that similarity to be very small. So that's the role of representation and similarity measure. And for a complex problem like uh, handwritten postal block reading, one single representation is not enough. And that's why, that's where I think Julie Harry's contribution was to take multiple representations and then combine them. So the paper which he wrote with Finn Ho, for example, of the rank level fusion, that's an example where they took multiple classifiers to solve the same problem and then combine the predictions. So <clears throat> what I want to convey to you is that the People in the research community now forget it about what problem they are trying to solve. They simply have the data available, whether it's object recognition, object classification, or any other problem. But we really need to start today with a specific problem faced by a real world entity and end up with an action having an impact on that entity. So I think the Shuri Harris main contribution. And his name is synonymous with handwriting recognition. I mean, that's the, that's the highest uh, uh, recognition we can give to somebody. If you mention Sri Hari's name, that's the first thing which comes to mind, that he made a lot of contribution in handwriting recognition. And in fact, his, uh, he was selected to be on the National Academy Study Report because of his work on handwriting recognition. So this is a, a old uh, photo of you know people have been trying to build uh, handwriting recognition systems for a long time, but I want to show you this video if it works. So basically, the main contribution is to read the address block and then spray the, the, the zip code and the, the barcode, which is shown at the bottom of the letter. Uh, and the 
context, uh, Bharat mentioned about the context, and the, the role of the context here is that, uh, you know, things in the address block are not independent. The speak address, the, uh, the house number, the city, the state, and the zip code, they all have some relationship with each other. They are not independent. So he was able to build a system. So I think if I followed his papers over the years as I was reading, and he, you know, he sort of divided, conquer, took the divided conquer approach, worked on context, worked on classifier fusion, uh, worked on individual character recognition, word recognition, and so on. So I, I think this is the paper with Tim Ho, and I think Tim will talk about it. This is the individuality of the, of the handwriting, again, this is an important problem. Um, unfortunately, there's no good answer to it because we don't have enough data. What is the probability of false correspondence when 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 uh, when the police arrest somebody? Look at what the CSI shows. Crime investigation. There is a forensic evidence, but there could be handwriting, it could be fingerprints, it could be you know partial face image from the CCTV camera, and you search against the so what is the probability that, and if they arrest me, for example, based on some partial fingerprint at a crime scene, what is the chance that that partial fingerprint was left by Bharat or anybody else? Nobody knows that. Of course, if you talk to the forensics examiners, maybe scientists examiners, they will say fingerprints do not matter. And I remember in mid 1990s I gave a talk at the National Academy for the Science Symposium where I made a, where I said, look, based on my computation, the probability of false correspondence is let's say 10 to the minus 4. And the head of the FBI made an examiner stood up and said, no, you're wrong. Fingerprints do not make mistakes. You know? And I think 99 before We need a quantitative analysis of the forensic evidence. And I think I want to show you this because this, this particular forensic evidence bite mark has been covered quite extensively in New York Times and it has been uh, followed up by, by the Innocence Project. Many of you may know Innocence Project, but it is an organization. Uh, and every state has a chapter of the Innocence Project. Um, the purpose of this is to examine death row inmates, that is, people who have been uh, prosecuted and convicted and then put, put on the death row. And so the Innocence Project selectively chooses cases where they think they can uh, exonerate those individuals based on the DNA evidence or any other kinds of and so, the, you know, there were so-called experts on the forensic, forensic dentistry, doctors who were charging $5,000 to testify in the court. And all they will do, they will make an impression of the suspect's teeth, which is shown on the right side, in blue. And they will put it on the, on the victim's, the mark on the victim's body. And then, aha, I can now say without any doubt that this bite mark was made by this one. They will not check anybody else's bite mark. And that is really what's wrong in the forensic science. And actually, uh, his uh, service on that uh, National Academy of Panel. So this is the report of the Everybody in forensic science knows about it. And what is most important is the bullet number three and four. The same technique used by different analysts or forensic scientists, forensic, forensic analysts can lead to different results. Not only that, the same technique used by the same analyst on the same sample can lead to a different result. So if you get the same uh, 
partial fingerprint and full fingerprint to a forensic scientist today. He will make some contribution. And if you give the same data to the same guy three days later, he may come up with a different answer. So there's a subjectivity involved in, in convicting people. This is very, very important. So, and then I think in what in forensic science, or at least the computational part of forensic science, led to the field of computational forensics, which is a workshop which is held every year. And finally, just to just to close, I, I this is the 1990 uh, article which appeared in the Plain Field in Ohio. And I think it's very important that he had the foresight to say that humans don't just do character recognition. That is, we don't build a postal address recognition machine by just feeding one thing at a time. Sometimes, you know, if, if, you, if you read somebody's handwriting, and many of you are professors, so you read the tests, and uh, sometimes just a scribble, right? So you do it at the word level. And sometimes you don't understand the word the context helps. And, and that's, that underlines his work in building postal machine. So with that, I'm very grateful that you gave me, gave me an opportunity to, to invite here. Um, I'll miss him, and I wish we had met at some other uh, occasion, but this is an opportunity to pay tribute to this contribution, which, uh, which is now embedded in Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Professor Jane for a very inspiring uh, lecture. Um, so next up, um, we have um, a group of uh, early students of uh, Professor Shihari's uh, um, group, there are several of us here, so including myself, but I'll let uh, Gita start. Uh, Gita Sirkanton uh, was also one of the earliest uh, Gita students, so why don't you uh, Gita, uh, get us started?
this work was from this NSF project that got, uh, that was uh, led to the OCR work that became successful. Until then, nobody else had actually worked on OCR at this level. And uh, this kind of demonstrated what uh, Harry's vision was for this area and led to future successes. Uh, so I think my goal has been collecting all this material from all our colleagues and putting it together and uh, reporting the way together. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Tina. Yeah, I, I think you will just go through the pictures. I'll try this. So this is one of the earliest uh, newspaper uh, reporting of uh, of about the postal service uh, search work, uh, I think uh, John think this is a nice to nice uh, uh, clip to show from how these things are uh, reported. And again, here is also one of the earliest uh, newspaper appearance of the project at UB. Um, you can see uh, Jonathan Hall here. Uh, uh, you still see him. Uh, I don't know if you can recognize him in this way, but uh, he's uh, one of the earliest. Uh, uh, reporting of the postal projects uh, at UB. Um, so John uh, had uh, quite a few of the remarks here, but I think we can just uh, talk about that over the pictures. So, so these are some of the earliest uh, days there. Um, I believe that this is a going away dinner party for Chainway One, and, and there you see him sitting in the center along with his wife. And I believe that this is one of the earliest uh, groups that I have uh, known since I went into CEDA. I went there uh, while um, there was a almost a finishing project on address block location on parcel images, uh, which is a, actually a very difficult problem. Think about how, how parcels looks like. You take a picture and you need to find the address block there. And Chile and also Yama Kwan, and of course, uh, Jonathan Ho and, and also Paul, and a few of the earliest students you see, was really active, uh, and they did a lot of work on that project, uh, which uh, started many of the following ones uh, continuing on, on this effort. So here is another group of uh, um, uh, students here. Um, so it's in Da Ching Wan, uh, he's a visiting scholar from uh, China, one of the very earliest uh, uh, who came to the US in those times. And then, of course, we have Ed Cohen and Paul Barambo that are discussing something serious about the handwriting projects. So this is uh, uh, going away dinner for Jonathan Paul. Um, so we see uh, Jonathan and also Andrew, uh, his uh, wife. I, uh, he actually went to uh, Oracle and he's my colleague of my husband later on. And we also see uh, Effie Kleinberg, uh, who is uh, the wife of Professor Eugene Kleinberg. Uh, who later had a lot of interaction uh, uh, with me. Um, so at that time, uh, so they were actively working in CNA. I believe Effie was a uh, good time software engineer, they right? hired a SWAT team around uh, CNA, so formal establishment. So I think we overlap briefly. Uh, here's another picture from the going away dinner for Jonathan Hall. Um, I believe I know. Stephen Lam, who is standing in the middle, uh, who is uh, one of the uh, key person in the newspaper image recognition project, which is another uh, project involving very complex uh, image layouts. And I believe uh, there's Ron Curtis, uh, uh, Curtis uh, sitting on the back, and uh, Kita, of course, you see. And then there are, oh, and, and so, well, it's so nice for me to see these familiar faces out here, there again. So this is uh, Harry who uh, is sitting in the head of the, con um, the meeting room. Actually, this is a room very familiar to us because we meet every week there. Every project meets every week there. So this is like uh, our every, every week's the duty, right? You need to make sure you have something to say in, in the meeting line. Right? And there is uh, where he was sitting. And then you would go around the table and so every one of us uh, need to make sure we have something to talk about. What did you do? And there he was. And then uh, this is uh, an, uh, oh yeah, this is the opening of the equipment office on the fifth floor of the body hall. So there you see several of them uh, sitting very seriously and happily because of all this equipment. And what equipment are we talking about? So these are the equipment that we have at that time. So you see uh, some of the sun uh, servers, uh, and then in our office we have the monitors, uh, the workstations that are connected back. Some of these are connected back to these uh, devices in the equipment room. 
and you see this uh, disk drive uh, and also a tape drive. I don't know if you still remember tape uh, these days. Uh, do people still use tapes uh, at all? And then there's the scanner, that, uh, and then there are others uh, you know, that are not in the picture. But uh, having an equipment room uh, like this uh, was not useful. I remember that we are talking about in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, where building a, a, a dedicated uh, computer lab to this area uh, is, a, is a very weird occurrence in the field. There are not that many schools uh, who were able to do that. And uh, were it not for the postal funding and, and many of the active projects going on, I think this would not have been possible. Again, when I think about all this, I just think a lot about all these efforts, all the sweats that went into writing many of these uh, proposal, proposals and, and all the efforts on uh, discussing and understanding things with the clients. Uh, there's a long, long process involved that I think many of you are, are well aware of that. So I was just thinking about all the effort that were behind the scenes, behind all this equipment and behind these um, uh, setups. So here's another picture from the Jing Wei Wen uh, party. Again, you see several of our uh, familiar faces. And here's uh, Elman Guang. Uh, he's uh, one, again one of the earliest person who work on the handwriting projects. I remember Yohanna for the things that he made, rule-based system for recognizing handwritten digits. He dedicated the crafts and hundreds and hundreds of rules. Of, <laughs> I think this was one of the first things that were being tried on the handwriting project. But of course, uh, later uh, they, they developed a lot more fancier methods than that. But he was one of the very first person, persons uh, in the lab who actually tried to crack the problem. So now, these days, uh, we don't look at group based systems. Uh, um, we, we don't think of that uh, very highly or something. But I was uh, just uh, thinking about the effort behind that. So the determination to, to get the problem solved no matter what. So I think we could still celebrate the effort behind the scenes, right, regardless of the progress of the technology. So here is the other again, the way from you are saying, oh, this was the hallway of Holly Hall. Took me a while to remember. Again, our meeting room, these are both uh, remembering, we, we, we memorable and also fearful meeting room. <laughs> and we, we meet you. And that's me, and I believe this must be Echo and showing his demo um, on uh, one of it his uh, latest achievements on the handwriting project. So now, uh, with all these pictures, I would like to uh, take us more into a, 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 um, maybe a more concise a summary uh, made by Professor Sherry himself uh, on, um, on the milestones also of this uh, postal project. So here are a few of the landmarks that uh, he dropped down uh, since the beginning of the very first effort. Uh, with an NSF grant uh, on the contextual OCL systems uh, in 1980. So think about that, it's 80, we're talking about 40, over 40 years uh, ago. And then uh, after that, uh, as uh, it was mentioned earlier, we got, uh, he got the first uh, USPS uh, contract. Um, and then uh, I think I joined um, the group in 1988. By then, there were uh, two projects that were active. The address block location problem was already almost uh, finishing, and then the handwriting uh, project was just uh, starting, and that's why we saw the owner and, and other people uh, working on them. And uh, when I joined in, I, we also uh, have another system on contextual uh, machine print address recognition that I'll talk about a bit later. So there were a few projects going on, um, and one of the transition one is in uh, 1993, right, when CEDA was uh, formally, the CEDA grant was formally awarded. Um, and a bit of the, my, my remembering uh, um, of those times is that, uh, so some of these uh, came out of uh, an, an effort that, um, that really impressed the postmaster, assistant postmaster general, Karen Fumoto. So she was uh, one of the key persons who uh, admired our projects a lot, and he was uh, pushing a lot on the, on the formation of this uh, lab. Um, and eventually, this led to the, to the establishment of CEDA. So, and I remember her in several of our study visits. At that time, when they gave the projects to, 
to uh, UB, they came every month, I believe, for, for site visits. So there will be some uh, one or two representatives from the postal service, along with uh, again one or two representatives from a consultant agency that they hire to supervise these projects. And many of these projects are formed as a competitive project. So I remember the project I worked on, there were three contractors. So besides uh, UB, there were two other commercial labs uh, who were also working on the same problem. And we are going to have uh, competitions also. And they did filter out, they, they did throw out one of them yeah, over a certain period of time. So this was a very serious deal. It was not, <laughs> it was not a homework exercise. <laughs> we are talking about uh, uh, a, a, a go or no go decision for many, uh, many some big decisions uh, at the agency level. But uh, the success uh, of uh, these earlier projects uh, led to the foundation of uh, CEDA. Um, that was a, a, uh, a big transition. And of course, uh, after that, uh, there are several, uh, many other grants, including this very sustained effort on handwriting and jazz recognition uh, that continued all the way uh, for, for many years and until the full deployment of a practical system in the postal service. And you can see that uh, it's not only the US, right? the technology was also um, uh, transferred to Australia as well as to UK. So the impact of uh, what uh, Professor Shihari's uh, the handwriting projects uh, that started in CEDA, the impact is not only on this country, but it's also over to a few other systems over the world. So we can look a little bit closer into the, the problem of handwriting address uh, understanding. So here you can see that the, the writing on the envelope can often be very messy. And I think even for a person like me, right, and very often I would have a hard time to read uh, a just uh, writing uh, written like that. So, um, and then uh, on top of that, it's not only recognizing the shape, um, and there's also the syntax of the address that is also involved. I think this is also one of the places where the so-called higher level AI, when we talk about constraint satisfaction and these higher level AI technologies interact with these lower level perceptual methods uh, like uh, uh, recognizing images with all these different kinds of methods. These days you all well know. Now um, the impact of this project is uh, that we are talking about hundreds of millions of labor costs saved in just the first deployment year. And then over the time since this first deployment, you can imagine the saving of, uh, in terms of the processing costs of this inherited mail right, to the post office. Um, and it's uh, very remarkable that uh, at least at the time when, when Professor Jerry prepared these slides, right, that's over 83 of percent of all this handwriting mail uh, processed automatically to up to 98% accuracy. So this is very remarkable uh, success in terms of a practical system that originated from like academic research, right? We are like students and teachers uh, uh, trying to solve a problem that's intriguing, but then he developed that all the way to a practical deployable <coughs> system. So um, as uh, we heard earlier, right, so from uh, Professor Jean's comment that pattern recognition is not just a time when data set and then quite point oh one percent increase in accuracy, right? It's not a job just like that. If you really want to do something for real to be serious, there's a lot involved in understanding the background of your application, understand your clients, uh, work environment, their context, their ability, their constraints. And then how do you develop your technology? You still want to solve the problem, and this is the academic part. You need to solve the problem, build your original methods, a creative method to solve the problem. And then you need to fit it back to your client's work environment and make it real, make it acceptable, make it convincing. So there's a lot of efforts involved in all that. So I think when we remember Professor Shihari's accomplishments, it's not only the papers that, I, that came to my mind, right? It's all the efforts behind the scenes in assembling the, the resources, uh, hiring students, and putting up the grant proposals, many, many of these grant proposals, uh, and then 
building, finding the facilities, negotiating with all parties of buying nets or chairs or computers, and then all this. And, and then this is just the beginning. And then he got to supervise the students. Uh, um, and he supervised us in a kind way, and this is also an accomplishment that is uh, not, you, you, you don't see everywhere, right? it's not universal. Right? Some people uh, supervise students in other ways, uh, but he chose to supervise in, in a very kind way. Give us room to make errors, and give us uh, room to pursue something that is not necessarily the immediate need of the project, but go something deeper towards the science, towards your dissertation, towards something that is uh, that can contribute to the rest of the community, to the other applications. So when I think about uh, Professor Jerry's account, these are all these other things that came to my mind. Right? So I just want to put in my personal remarks on, on top of that. Now in terms of the AI technology, so of course uh, we, we have at the, at the bottom most uh, layer, there are these image recognition algorithms uh, which go into the simple recognition layer. And then when you need to uh, connect up the, the interpretation of these symbols, then we come to this uh, uh, a little bit intermediate method. So in this case, um, when we try to adjust a cursive word recognition, uh, um, one of the key technologies that was used then is the hidden Markov model. So this involves, uh, again, trying to integrate knowledge that you know from several layers, from the pixel layer, and then there is this hidden state, which is the intermediate transition of the symbols, or, or could be fragments of a symbol. And then at the bottom layer, you come to the, the word itself, right? what words you can find in the dictionary, that is the language model. So hidden markers model is an integration of uh, knowledge from these uh, several uh, sources, and then Brought, bring, uh, that they are got, got, uh, brought together in an organic way and then to make a, a very elegant uh, optimization algorithm out of it. So I think this was the key technology that was used um, for the cursive word recognition problem. And then, as I said earlier, right, on top of that, you put in the knowledge, the higher level knowledge around the address itself. Like, uh, this include constraints on the street numbers, right? Like, uh, if you know if you know the street name, if you can recognize the city name, then you know what streets are possible there. And if you know the street, you know what are the ranges of numbers are there. So then, and if you can leverage all these uh, constraints together, that would contribute to your overall uh, ability to interpret the entire address. Uh, this would be added on top of what you find from the pictures itself, from the from the pixels. So I guess uh, to summarize, right, this would be the lessons that I learned from this uh, project. Uh, so the context is very important in this whole process and it could be used to help with uh, removing some of the ambiguity that you could often run into when you read the images. And then uh, when, when all, you have all these uh, diverse sources of knowledge, there are different statistical methods that can be employed to bring this together. Hidden Markov's model was one, and then we, we also heard about decision combination, that's another round of statistical methods. And there are many of those. And one of the, um, the most uh, uh, surprising discovery in this work is that sometimes a machine performance can actually exceed the human performance, because a machine sometimes you can leverage knowledge like that. For example, a person may not know, right? When you say the uh, main street, <laughs> your public is in every city, but there's a, another street. Um, there could be only happening in, in a certain town, in a certain city. And these are the knowledge that uh, a, a ordinary person or a male shorter, unless he's familiar with that city, where right, he may not know. But machines are able to uh, include all this knowledge in its reserve and then uh, bring them up for use at, at, at a suitable time to, to throw on suitable constraints to make the recognition successful. So I guess uh, this is mine. So as I said, that this is uh, uh, as much a celebration of the deployment of this uh, practical system uh, and now it's actually handling over 70 million handwriting addresses daily. And this slide that I've written a few years back, right? I think by now these numbers probably have seen much growth uh, since then. And at a remarkable speed. And this is uh, um, 
an achievement uh, for over 15 years of uh, research and development here at SUNY and Buffalo. So I think we just want to uh, remember that. Yeah, yeah follow up work we, we have this uh, pick up by uh, some other industrial uh, uh, companies. Uh, they actually do some of the more uh, detailed uh, refinement and, and implementation. But the original methodology and the whole process itself is all conceived in in uh, Professor Jerry's uh, lab here. Yeah. As we see, it's an uh, impact, there's a tremendous uh, impact on US and also over the world. Um, all right, so, um, so that would be about it. Now, at this point, I just want to just uh, say a little thing about my personal perspective in all that, right? So, uh, I joined uh, this uh, project uh, earlier, um, at, Essentially, before the name of CEDA that came about, it was still called the Laboratory of Document Image Recognition, something like that. But I joined the group in uh, 1988, um, and soon after I started, um, I remember I went to a, a meal processing regional center at William Street in Buffalo uh, with Jonathan Howe and Echo. And, so we were there to try to collect some image samples from the postal sorting machines to build up a data set that we could use to build the learning algorithms. So I just want to recall with you a few of the very remarkable things that I saw there. So here on the left hand side you see this mail sorting machine that you see is fully in action uh, in Professor Jane's video. But there is something that caught my eye there. So there is this uh, maze like uh, conveyor belt. So, so the conveyor belt was carrying the letter not only through all these uh, different uh, stations, yeah, but also a, a gigantic maze of curvy lines. I was just, why are we doing that? Why are we routing these letters this way and this way? And, and then people told me that these are the delay lines. Uh, they actually intentionally make the letter travel a long, long, long uh, trajectory you know, on, on a flat surface uh, so that to give time for the computer to work on the address. So, um, so that is something that actually uh, impressed me a lot, right? so that if you can get the help from work faster, hopefully there will be less uh, miles that these letters uh, need to travel. Now the other thing that caught my mind is uh, there's another room. Uh, here I, I found the pictures of only one row, but the room that I saw is a gigantic classroom. And there are many, many rows of people like that. And what are they doing there? So here yeah, I found a, a video clip online about this machine that they are actually working on. This is a so-called multi-position letter sorting machine. So, you can see that there, so every person is sitting in front of one such machine and on her left hand and right hand there's a keyboard. So, and you see that, so for every second or maybe even less than a second, there's a mechanical arm that will pick up a letter, flip it to the front of this person's surface, the face, and then you'll read that and then you'll type uh, the, 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 the zip code or the number that he saw from the envelope into this machine. And these people are there, sitting there all day, eight hours at the, for, for a shift, all day, all year, just doing that. If they let the fit uh, to from the front of her surface, and he will do that, and then he will, that, he will just do that. <laughs> they do that. Think about that. What kind of job is this? Right? And then there are thousands and thousands of people doing that over the whole country. So I, I don't know what I should feel at that time. Right? I just feel very sad. Why would people be? subject to this kind of labor, right? This is why we work, right? This is why we, we want to make machines to, to, to free people <coughs> of this kind of terrible, terrible mental labor. Yeah. Yeah, so now uh, I'm so glad to, 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 to see that, right? Hopefully more than 80% of this, uh, these jobs have gone away. Um, I believe people will find better jobs and more fulfilling jobs than that. But, but the point of uh, building this automated mail sorting system to read this difficult to read image is to free up the slavery, labors like that, right, from, from people, from any people's uh, lives. 
So this is my personal opinion. So when I joined, uh, I, I actually participated not in the handwriting project, but in another uh, project that is more about machine printed uh, uh, web images. So people would say that, okay, machine printed uh, images uh, solve the problem, but it's not. So look at the kind of images we want to deal with. Because uh, these images were captured in these high-speed scanners, uh, so they were only 200 pixels so per inch, uh, they are very, very degraded, I would say. So you can see that some of these are just barely readable. So I, I would just, just challenge anyone to try to read these two lines. <laughs> so if you're doing better than machine, then what kind of uh, method you have to invoke to make this work? And then with a single word like Douglas, right, you see all these uh, different variations also. Now, as uh, we said, right, just my later in the handwriting and just recognition, uh, our goal is to try to read these uh, city names and street names uh, so that we can make this uh, constraints on the zip code or to even elaborate on the zip code to short that to the carry route. So the goal is that if we are presented with a word image like that and we want to rank all the possible words that we know in the lexicon for the street name or the city name and to, to give a rank order and give our best guess so the top three choices will constrain the possibility of the, of the zip code or the carry route. But, but for an image, like uh, that, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the Zoom, all right, <laughs> from the Zoom, <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, yeah, if, I, I do need to be interrupted, please let me know, uh, just talk away. Um, but think about this diverse word image, right? So there are so many different ways you can think about it. So I actually started with the so-called word shape recognition approach, uh, which was uh, Jonathan Hall's earlier dissertation. So he had uh, suggested um, we should not follow only the traditional way of dividing a word into character, individual characters, uh, and then recognize individual characters, but instead we should take the whole word as a single piece and then try to derive the features from that and then try to recognize that as a whole entity. Because uh, this is the way we can overcome the, the problematic uh, segmentation, right? Like this uh, word hard is actually quite hard to divide them into the isolated symbols. So um, before me, uh, Jonathan had uh, finished a dissertation on this uh, technology, some, ori some original and initial methods for this technology. So I was uh, supposed to follow on and to try to try to develop that into the practical method that could be useful in, in actual deployment. But, uh, well, think about a diverse shape like that, right? So there are so many different ways you can describe a shape, right? You can divide them into grids, or you can extract corners or joints out of it and then put it into a string. So there are so many different ways. And I was uh, so fortunate that to be in a, doing that in a, in an academic lab that might have the freedom that is offered by Professor Shahari that I can actually explore and try these so many different things. Um, and then soon after, I realized that uh, it's not a single method that can do the job, right? and there could be many different methods are possible, but which ones are the best? I think the dominant mentality in those years is that out of all these possible methods, you should find one best method, and then you would use it. But I am faced with this uh, large possibility here, large set of possibility here. You can do it as a word in a whole, or you can divide up the word. Some words are actually dividable. Or you can just look at the, whatever it is, the divide, divide the pieces there and follow the segments, uh, and then try to deal with the segments at a time, like what you do in the cursive script uh, later. But then how are you going to make this choice? Uh, so in order to understand this method better, I made a plot at or a table like that, what you see on the right. So this is the one, to me this is a very historical and, and uh, landmark uh, picture in, in my career. Is that what I'm trying to print here is the, the rank of the true word yeah, in the ranking produced by that classifier. So the smaller the number, the better they are. So for example, this uh, classifier number two is able to rank the true word of image one at the top choice. So he's the best guy for this image.
But what is remarkable to me from this table is that you see these small numbers all over the place. They don't concentrate on, on one column. So this is to say that you may need a system that will be able to leverage all of this technology in some way and try to pick the, pick the very best of each of them. Now how exactly do we do that? A, a simple combination may not necessarily do the job and you need a smarter way to do that. So there we, we, we ran into actually investigate the method of combination. And that started uh, my, my uh, journey on this so-called multiple classifier system technology. So that's about all. So here I just want to summarize my, my last uh, 30 years after I went from this project in Cedar. So in, over my career, we have developed that into several streams of, uh, of work that I followed on, including um, uh, the follow-up work, uh, which is uh, now known as uh, Random Decision Forest. I should also say that this work also came from UB. Uh, so this work uh, was an implementation of a mathematical theory called stochastic discrimination that is uh, proposed by a mathematics professor here in Buffalo. So after I finished my postal projects, uh, I was uh, looking into the continuation of this multiple classifier system method, and I went to Bellabs for an interview, and then one of the interviewees asked me, right, so what if your number of classifiers go to infinity? So, so that is something I never thought about. But then I remember I heard this professor giving a talk earlier, talking about that. So that's how all this started, and then I went to him, and then later we we continue with about 10 years of uh, intensive exchanges over that. So, this is a forest was one of the side products of these exchanges, I would say. Now, of course, other than that, right, the, the use of context uh, uh, also evolved into more elaborate um, language models, and then later on, we take it to NLP and do that in many, many different flavors of NLP. Yeah. And on the image side, we I went into Bellabs and then I started collaboration with Henry Lett and he also has another very ambitious goal. Not only he wants to solve one simple recognition problem, but he wants to solve all such problems in the world. That means all languages, all fonts, all qualities. <laughs> now how is he able to do that? In order to do that, he creates what is called an image defect model, which is you can parameterize the, the degradation that could happen to some image. Now with that, we, we developed some simulations, and eventually the simulation itself uh, took a life of its own. Um, it developed into something data, right? and didn't work on op optics, uh, fiber optics or so. Uh, but anyway, this is my career, but I want to say that uh, everything started from CEDA, started from this postal projects, and all the inspirations that came out of that. Now, um, Besides that, I also uh, want to um, introduce uh, some tribute of another of our fellow students, um, Lin Zhang, uh, who sent us uh, some video speech uh, about his experience in CEDA and also his, uh, his uh, take on, on all this. So uh, Bin uh, later worked on the handwriting address uh, project and he's now also took a different turn of his career. He's now at the Ichikan School of Medicine working a lot on computational biology. So I'll just uh, let him speak. I'm Bin Zhang from Icon School of Medicine and I'm on Sana in New York City. I'm a professor in genetics and genomic sciences and the director of Monsanto Center for Transformative Disease Modeling. I was a PhD student with Professor Sri Harvey from 2000 to 2003. As many other students at CETA, I was lucky to work on a handwritten address interpretation system established by Professor Sri Harvey. HWIN was one of the largest pattern recognition systems at the time. Harvey challenged me to improve one key component of the system, handwritten character classification. While he was happy with the practical solutions, he was more interested in the writing of breakthroughs. I still remember our many long discussions about geometric relationships of objects in extremely high dimensional space. 
which led to the development of a novel fast classification method. As a great inventor, Harry knew how to get students to break barriers to find solutions. Well, we didn't have many chance to meet since I left Buffalo in 2003, almost 20 years ago. Harry kept track of my career development and even my research on Facebook. Harry often applauded for the awards my daughters received from many music competitions. Unfortunately, I don't have that many awards from my research. In the end of 2021, I promised her that I would pay him a visit in the new year, and my daughters would prepare a mini concert for him. Although we can never see Harry again, my daughters, Felina and Nikita, prepare music for Harry. I wish he could hear Harry. We will always miss you. Send uh, his daughter's uh, piece uh, for Harry. And I, while I start this uh, playing, I also want to introduce uh, Rick uh, Frenich, uh, who would continue with the next uh, uh, set of tributes. Uh, so, why don't we let this play and then we can finish? Uh, <laughs>
the charge on Hanbury, okay? Ed wasn't able to be here, but this is his tribute. Uh, before Hari formed Cedar, uh, USPS was reading less than 2% of the zip codes on handwriting mail. Less than 2%. And what did we hear that number grew to after the systems were deployed? Over 80%. That's where that, that um, you have to have something to make this go, right? And what go was the financial the, the financial background of the USPS just kind of allowed this to launch. Okay, and, and it ties Tim's comments together about we were in the, kind of we were in the right place at the right time. Okay, um, no guarantee of finding solutions. It was research after all, right? But Ari gave us the create the, the create uh, uh, ability to create and create solutions. Okay, and we had we had the um, the resources to do it. So Ed here is crediting uh, John Hall too, who broke the, com the problem into components. Break a eat an elephant one bite at a time. Not not attempting to offend anybody here, right? But this is this is what I tell my kids when there's a very complex problem. Take a little piece at a time and then put it all together to solve the problem, okay? Uh, and along the way, we created it because you can't solve a big, ubiquitous problem with hundreds of millions of pieces of mail without having a big database behind it. So we went through a lot of iterations of trying to capture big data, big sets of images for machine print and hand print so that we could solve these problems. Or I got dozens of students to, students to achieve their own groundbreaking research. And ultimately, that resulted in going from 2% to over 70% Ed, Ed has for nine digits. And it even went beyond that into 11 digits. Okay, which we don't ever hear about, but, but we went to 11 digit sort of. At the same time, Venu was here, uh, Venu Go and Duraggio, and his tribute is basically, uh, and I'll let you read this, but it was a, a very warm uh, tribute paying, uh, paying attention to Hari's very kind nature, okay, and his guidance for students, and his understanding, and uh, allowing Venu to go home to India to get married, okay, without having a penalty of having to catch up on his work. So, uh, Venu is very complimentary of, of um, Hari's approach to the work environment. And at the bottom, it even said, Venu, go to Bonas for me in southern France, a chateau in southern France run by Jean-Claude Simon who was another big researcher in our area. And I got to go uh, to Bonas at a different time. And Harry says, take that as your honeymoon. Very enchanting, I'm sure. But Bain was pulling out uh, the kindness of Harry in his tribute. Okay? Darshang Lee was my office mate in Baldy Hall. Okay? Uh, um, our, Darshan had just graduated from um, undergraduate school and then, then became a graduate student and worked with Cedar. So he graduated under Dr. Srihari in 1995. Today he wants to share some memories of Har uh, Hari's founder of Cedar and Darshan's PhD advisor. We first met Hari in the senior year of undergrad, working part-time on a project, of course, that Hari and John Hall were working together on, teaching machines how to read handwritten addresses. Probably Ed Cohen was working on that project too, right? That project would prove so, so successful that it became kind of the, the building blocks of Cedar because that was kind of a big program that we pulled everything together that everybody was working on. Okay? Close to 100 students and full-time employees at the time that Cedar was started. 
And I'll, I'll show you a slide uh, next that will bring back some memory for some from Cedar people about this. Uh, we were full of energy, we were full of optimism, we were, full, we were ready to solve problems. The projects were exciting and impactful. We were all proud to be part of the Cedar legacy. At Cedar, Hari introduced him, uh, Darshang, to the field of machine learning. He took his pattern recognition class and found it fascinating. Under his supervision, he researched and learned advanced neural network te techniques. Darshang was our first person inside to work on neural networks. And he was my office mate. <laughs> As an advisor, Hari was inspiring. He always encouraged us to think deeper about problems. You know, what did Einstein say? Uh, think deeply about simple things. Hari would say the same things to us, and he would bring these out in meetings about, well, think about that a little bit more. Think about, you know, how you, how you could do, do this a little bit better. And, if, and Darshan credits uh, Hari for not, he, because Darshan would not have completed his study without his constant guidance and support. During those years, Hari was an incredible mentor to Darshan as well, and helped him through the PhD program. Looking back on this journey, the dots connected, and they led him where he would, is now. Uh, he worked on Google's book project to help them. More than a decade later, he was moved to Google Maps. Okay, I think he did some work with John Hall along the way there too, perhaps at Bell Labs or at Rico. Uh, I'm deeply grateful to Hari for providing me the great learning opportunities for teaching me the topics that shaped my career and for guiding me through those important life choices that Darshan had to make. He wants to offer his condolences to Rohini and the family and to Hari, and he wants to say thank you and rest in peace. There's Darshan on the left and Hari on the right. And this is the, uh, the graduation in 1995 of all the with all the graduates uh, surrounding. Oh, there's Keitha too. Now, my tribute, okay. I started working at Ari's lab in 1989. I had just graduated and I took a different job. Two weeks after I took that job, Ari called me and said, sat me down and gave, and let me, gave me lunch. He said, what do you, you, you want to do something exciting? And I'm like, yeah. I don't want to run the machines that Tin Can Ho showed you, okay, the rest of my life. Okay, I want to do something real interesting. And, and he gave me the opportunity to not go down that path, because that was the path I was going down. I could see it already in two weeks into my job, okay? And so it was really a no-brainer. It was kind of the Walt, if you watch the movie uh, Secret Life of Walter Mitty, this is the kind of the search for the negative. Hari sent me on that search for the negative. Okay, and I didn't look back. I took it and I kept moving forward. And that's, and, and all those great things, Tin Cam, Etha, uh, Darshan, all those things they said, and they know all those things they said about Hari were true. He encouraged people to go beyond, look at the deep cracks, figure out what, what's going on. So with, and with the help of Mike Roach and John Giantino from Cedar, I gathered a few interesting documents from our history, um, and I found this one, it was a, a, an annual publication for LGIU, the Laboratory of Document Image Understanding. That's what we were before Cedar. Okay, and it had some really interesting data in it I'm gonna share with you. My time at Cedar ended in 1994, um, and so I'm only going to give you perspectives up to that point, but Hari's ability to do, dig deep into things, uh, we have so many things in common, right, because we both went to Ohio State University, okay, uh, we both worked on document analysis and fingerprints, that's my, I run a company now on fingerprints, and. A lot of the things that Hari 
already did, uh, or was, were inspiration for things that I do now. So this timeline is kind of it's, it's kind of interesting. This is all the way from 1980, which is the NSF days, the original National Science Foundation grant days, up to when I left in 1994. And it's a bar chart. It's, I'm just thinking simply about these things. The leftmost uh, color, the, the dark green, is the number of F NSF program grants that we had. It's one to start off with, okay? And it's one up till 1983 or so. Then we started getting into some postal programs, which is the lighter green, and you can see how the postal program built over time. I just don't have the data for 91 to 94 to see, tell you how many postal contracts we had, okay? But there's an interesting correlation here in that the number of projects that we were receiving, the number of publications went up, of course, right? But the, the thing is, is the quality of the work that was going into these publications is what we were getting recognized for as a group. And this paid dividends way beyond 1994 as the address block reader stuff got put out there. Okay, so this is what you would expect. Uh, you have a few projects and then a lag of a couple years and now the publications start, start taking off. Cedar formed in 1993, which is like the second year before I left. Um, through this entire cycle that I have here, Hari co-authored 66% of all the papers out of here. His early years, it was over 85%. So, as an industry guy, I'm telling you that's probably a very good thing because he's able to give up a little bit of, he can't do it all, right? But he's focusing on, on some of the better applicate, um, better, better um, papers and getting them out there. Uh, and he's helping build, build the recognition of a research group during that time. Fun facts. Those machines that they were showing you that, that had that blur of, of mail going back by 120 inches a second. That's how fast they were moving that was. And it was capturing imagery at 212 pixels per inch, binary data, black white data. Okay? That's quite actually quite a bit of data when you're capturing data that fast. Um, We'll get to more about that on the bottom. In the overview, we had six different postal programs to that point, including address block locations, some machine print, and some handwriting uh, application uh, research areas. We were doing hardware and software research, and we this is this kind of blew my mind. We had an address block location prototype system that was taking ten minutes per piece to find an address block on it software, 10 minutes per piece, and it was written in 17,000 lines of code of C and LISP. Today, in my business, we have code that's in the two, three million lines of code. Okay. Uh, it, it just shows you how far we, we've progressed, and we're using C Sharp, right? Um, the computers were named after the stars in the universe, all our sun workstations were. And we had an amazing 10 gigabytes of storage to store all that image data that we had. Okay? And that blows me away when I look at this and we have 128 gigabytes right there. Okay. It's crazy. But at the same time, we needed more data to allow us to, to do our jobs better. So what, you know, what it became, it became is we had to collect a lot more data from the postal server. And so we put um, a cage, literally a cage, in the, in the postal service building on William Street. And we collected and scanned fingerprint, uh, uh, fingerprint sorry. Uh, mail pieces for machine print and handwriting at the Postal Service and we bring the images back here so we could report on our 
statistics of the Postal Service. Now, as the question I promised you was, you know, to score the coffee, if somebody can name the name of Hari's computer, remember, it was a, it's named after a star in the universe, it will earn you a bag of coffee after, during the break, okay? Uh, and so what we saw is the major use case is like 2% to 80%, and that kind of was a secret to the success. So we have a big research group up in Baldy. These were our offices that we had, and that one off by itself was our conference room, one, one floor up, okay? And then in September 1990, we had 35 people. Two years later, when we moved into UB Commons, we had 64, at least 64 people. That was on the roster that I had. So we more than doubled the people in two years. Now, that is a very challenging proposition to grow an organization that fast. And it amazes me to this day that we could do this in a university. So what were the secrets that I think, from a commercial perspective, were his secrets for success? Absolutely the recognition for his NSF initial grant. That, that, got, that got him into the U.S. Postal Service, right? With the Postal Service, we were at the right time, right place at the right time, because they had a need that they identified was very expensive to them and that they were willing to put money into somebody who could do the job. And so we went through these competitive things that Tim, Tim Campbell's came come in from talking about. We always came up at the top, too. And we consistently did that. And so the Postal Service finally made the bet on us, and we became Cedar. He astutely created a strong mix of hardworking people and the people that got along together and solve problems together. We executed better than our competition. And, more, and importantly, he did marketing, papers and conferences and things like this to move that along. As a result, we learned and created and we enjoyed ourselves and what we were doing, and I call it a golden time. Because of that, he helped provide the resources to pull all that together. And that, my friends, is a very rare thing to do at a university. Having a foot in both sides and both worlds like that. Very hard to do. So I just want to say thank you for the opportunity, Ari. It's now time to take a break. <laughs>